Hey everybody, this week's Muses, Memoirs, and More show is uh, really uh, spooky. We had uh, Ryan Dunn on, who uh, has written books, uh, has his own tour company here in Savannah, and also has been on numerous TV uh, appearances and shows about paranormal investigation. So uh, tune in and I uh, hope you enjoy the podcast. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Give it a like, comment, share. I really appreciate it. WRUULP Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRUU.org. We are Savannah Soundings Community Radio with Global Soul. Welcome to Muses, Memoirs, and More, Savannah's show about authors, artists, and entertainers. I'm your host, Adam Messer. And today we have a special guest, Ryan Dunn. If you've checked out our Facebook page, we uh, we put a little introduction out there. But Ryan has uh, a lot of uh, spooky, cool stuff that he does. He has a tour company. He writes. He's also been on a lot of television shows, uh, doing investigations and stuff. And uh, so welcome to our show today, Ryan. Hey, thanks for having me. How's it going today? Uh, really good. Great day here in Savannah. Yeah, it's beautiful weather out. I'll tell you what, especially after uh, all the... Uh, the rain and the tornadoes we had yesterday, so I'm glad that was really nice today. So, can you uh, do like a little introduction for our listeners of who you are, what you do in, here in Savannah, and then we'll, we'll get into the writing and uh, we'll get into like the investigations and stuff like that, and then also those EVPs that you sent over, uh, which are kind of, you know, everybody listening, that's some pretty sc- scary kind of spooky stuff. Perfect. Yeah, uh, so we've been investigating Savannah for the past eight and a half years Mm -hmm. with a company called the Savannah Ghost Research Society. So my wife and I founded it in 2010, and we've done probably over 100 cases. Uh, We've got a team here with Brandon and Christy Humphrey and Chris Kirsten, too. Uh, So there's five of us in the team, and we go throughout the U.S. going to asylums and old prisons and a lot of stuff here in Savannah to find out the history and all the hauntings and investigations. Yeah, that's uh, that's pretty interesting, especially with Savannah being the oldest historical planned city in the U.S. And um, you have a lot of different history here that people aren't really aware of, especially with the tourism that we have. I know that there's a lot of uh, a lot of different historical markers and things like that. Uh, but there's so much that goes on in Savannah that has gone on in Savannah um, ever since they started. So what's uh, with your tourism company? Uh, what is what is the main focus? Where do, what, what are the kind of things that you cover with um, the guests that you have? And, you know, just can you give us an example of what it would be like on the tour? Yeah, two of our biggest things that set us apart on our tours is we do all of our own historic research okay. uh, with the Historic Society. Savannah has a lot of good stories. Yeah. There's a lot of urban legend, a lot of folklore. So we sift through the BS and try to make sure that what we're telling is very true and factual yeah. based on real historical events. Mm-hmm. And then on top of that, all the stops on our tour, we have investigated as our team. So we bring a tablet, and you get to hear some of these EVPs we've called at every location. Uh, you get to see some of the video apparitions we've called with thermal imaging and infrared cameras. So it's more of an interactive tour that you get to see the evidence and hear the real history, too. Yeah. And then they can di- decide for themselves, like, you know, kind of sort through it. But you, you approach the uh, you approach the tour and the investigations from kind of a historical perspective and more of a try to factually base stuff versus the urban legends or whatever correct right? and you know that's important on investigations because if you're going into a house and trying to communicate with the spirit you want to make sure that person actually died there so that it's not a you know a fake story about a suicide or a right. murder that never happened right. um we do research in a lot of cities and we'll find out some of these people that they say died maybe even died two states away so it's oh you know you want to wow. make sure it's factual is, is do you think that's one of the reasons why uh savannah's uh, been considered the most haunted city in the u.s in the nation i think you know there's a couple of things especially with our yellow fever epidemics uh slavery and the fact we paved over many cemeteries downtown they're still finding bodies doing renovations oh wow yeah so it's kind of kind of it's kind of spooky <laughs> yeah <laughs> <Kinda> creepy <laughs> yeah i don't think they're happy we paid over all the corpses so yeah uh progress sometimes can be uh painful so, uh, 
with that research and investigation, you, you have a couple books that you published and uh, written, and they're they're available locally here, right? Um, can you talk about that? You know, when you when you're doing an investigation, you're doing the research. You know, obviously you approach it more from kind of like a, a factual based uh, stance. What what is it like with the process of putting that together and you know going to publish and and then putting it out there? Yeah, it was uh, really hard at first because I'm a huge <clears throat> reader. I read a lot of Stephen King, a lot of horror fiction, yeah. a lot of classical fiction. But being a writer, uh, I don't think I could ever write fiction. You know, the plots and everything, I would yeah. love to, but I'm not good at it. But I had to approach this like telling a story, like sitting at a bar, having a drink with a friend, and telling them about an investigation or something that we had found. Yeah. And that way it was so much easier to put it into a book form. But um, I basically took all the history we had and did it from the history side and then added in our findings from the investigation. But uh, it took a lot of rewrites and a lot of reading over to get it. And the second book came a lot smoother than the first one, I believe. Yeah, and, and, and the genre itself is, is kind of like, um, what, what would you call it? Like, a, not, it's nonfiction. Right, because it's nonfiction. His, I guess his, but it is paranormal. I right? guess paranormal nonfiction. I don't know if that's yeah, a, new, yeah. a new term for books. So. Yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe we uh, just created a new thing. I don't know. <laughs> so. But it's kind of cool because in Savannah, there are, there are a lot of uh, places – that um, you know, focus on tourism. They they focus on historical events, or, you know, that have happened or whatever. And I think the the idea of having um, a company that tries to present the facts, you know, historical facts and and that kind of thing, um, with those EVPs and with the infrared documentation. You know, now I think most people, the first thought might be like Ghostbusters, you know, right. and it, it's so opposite of that, right? It is. I mean, if I could have a proton pack, I'd be happy. I'm a huge <laughs> yeah. fan of the yeah. show or the yeah. movie. I grew up watching Ghostbusters. I even have a Ghostbusters tattoo on my calf. Oh, wow. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a little, it's not more boring, but it's a lot more calm than some of the shows. Um, you know, it's many hours sitting with audio recorders, going through evidence, watching a camera, looking down a hallway for eight hours. Mm. You know, so it's very tedious looking for these findings. But there are times we get spooked. You know, we've been touched. We've been scratched. We've had stuff come running into the room where we're at. So it does get creepy. What, what's the scariest uh, event that you can think of that happened to you or to maybe one of your staff? Um, you know, we had a case a few years ago in 2015 where the Cathedral of St. John the Baptist had to exercise a house for us. We had three college students being physically attacked. And we're right next to the cathedral. Yeah, and it's, it's like yeah, on this next corner over. Yeah, right around the corner. So yeah. that's where we get all of our holy water, too. But uh, that was really creepy to have the church validate that. Um, and that's that's very rare. It is. Like the church is. does not just go out and say, you know, that this deems worthy of an exorcism. Um, they're very serious about what they do. And to have that, you know, those type of things, you know, I love my job. But dealing with those type of entities, the demonic, is something that I don't really want to be anywhere near. But yeah. we do have those cases pop up from time to time. I think it's interesting that you would have approached the the Catholic Church for an exorcism. I mean, it's, it's kind of like where you knew. Obviously, you're not an exorcist. You right. know, you're an investigator. Um, how did you come to decide that you there was something more serious that you needed some help? Um, you know, we, we were having a lot of stuff where these girls were getting these physical attacks. And we were noticing things happening in groups of three, which is usually a sign of the mocking the Trinity. Mm -hmm. um, clocks are setting themselves back three hours, four or three hours. And oh, wow. scratches are appearing in groups of three. And it seemed just very malevolent. And I contacted my pastor at the Methodist Church. And he said, Ryan, I believe you, but I'll put you in touch with the Catholic Church. They're the ones that you might want to get to handle this. And since then, um, I've still got, you know, one of the father's numbers in my speed dial. So, Wow. I think um, the movie The Right, did you ever see that? Uh, oh, yes, yes, with uh, Anthony Hopkins. Yeah, right? yes. yeah. That, I thought that was a really interesting movie about, you know, an exorcism. Um, I think there's a lot of unexplained stuff out there. And I think, you know, talking more about, like, you being an investigator and your team investigates, you know, different uh, events and, you know, what what's it like when, let's say, you know, Joe Schmo calls you up on the phone. <laughs> And they're like, you know, I've uh, I've got this, I've got this ghost is terrorizing me, blah, blah blah. How do you sort fact from fiction? How do you kind of filter out? Good question. We get a lot of calls, so a lot of times, you know, I spend thirty minutes to an hour talking the first time initially on the phone with these people. Oh wow! And we do get some people that are a little off that call us that are a little a little crazy. Yeah. So uh, we do have to filter through that. But within the first 10 minutes, you can usually pick up a lot of signals if they're, you know, not mentally stable right. or not. And so in that case, we might want to refer them to a psychiatrist or get them some help that way. Um, you know, I had one guy telling me that his neighbors were stealing skins and were, 
you know, he'd had dinner with Jesus Christ three different times in the past three weeks, and he oh, met wow. all the princes of hell. So we do have those type of calls. Oh, wow. But, um, you know, so we do get some really creepy calls. But a lot of times, you know, people usually legitimately have a claim. Or sometimes it could be a certain thing in the house causing a noise that they think is a haunting. So we have to look for that, too. Do you, do you ever have anyone uh, contact you after a loved one recently deceases? We have, and that's you know that's another thing. I take this job very seriously. So does my wife and our team, because mm-hmm. we are dealing with people's lives and emotions. Yeah. And you know we do get people that call us right after losing a loved one, sometimes a suicide or a very you know sudden death, and they have interactions with these ones. So we want to be able to approach that very sensitively. I had a pastor friend uh, one time tell me uh, it was his name was John, and uh, it was it was shortly after my dad died in two thousand six. And I kept having these uh, dreams about my dad, you know, would dream that he was coming to talk to me and that kind of thing, was, you know, after. And John uh, was telling me that he believed that uh, the afterlife was kind of like there was a river between the two, that the deceased passed back and forth until everyone that they knew in life Definitely. had passed on. I definitely believe that. You know, I, th- I think they're not here all the time, but I do believe they come and go. And yeah. then I think in some cases, especially in places like Savannah and some of these cities or mm-hmm. these buildings, some of them do tend to stay for whatever reason. Maybe they're trapped or whatever. But I think in that case, they do come to visit and speak to us and calm us down. Uh, you know, and that's that's a question I have because I, I don't know a lot about the paranormal investigation. Uh, I have very little background. I have a few friends that do it, uh, but I, I don't personally know a lot about it. Um, is there such a thing as residual energies that kind of stay in a, an area where a person deceases or there is, you know, there's different types of hauntings. And, um, there's a theory that came out in the 1950s by a British scientist called the stone tape theory. Mm-hmm. And the theory is that, you know, certain minerals and bedrock and things in the ground can hold energy. So when an event happens over top of it, it holds memory. So a lot of times places like Gettysburg, people are hearing these battle cries and these cannon fire Mm -hmm. hours after the place is closed. And we think these hauntings are happening because it held that memory of what happened from a tragic event. So a residual haunting can be scary that you're seeing spirits, but most of the time they can't interact with the living. They're almost like a movie that keeps replaying. That's a question I had uh, because uh, if you think about our, you know, like our basic atomic structure, it's all frequencies. Right. And... You know, I've always often wondered, you know, in the afterlife, if our frequency changes, you know, if we have, you know, like you said, it's kind of like a tape that's playing over and over right. again. If our frequency changes and that if someone has a destructive ending or if they have a lot of unresolved issues or whatever, if that if that frequency is just kind of caught in a repetitive motion or something like that. That makes sense, you know, and I think some people, too, that especially like suicides or people that just died very young or very suddenly feel like it was cut too short. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, that that frequency or them, they're still here because they want to live life longer. I had uh, had a friend recently that her son was in a terrible car accident. He was on life support for two weeks, and it just – they had to do a, a do not resuscitate and so he's he's been deceased for about two weeks and you know she's she's been having nightmares and you know obviously you know as a mother or whatever you know it's a traumatic event and you know it's it's very traumatic for the family uh but you know having that kind of a death um you know a traumatic death like that and you know there are car accidents every day right um so we're going to do a little quick station ID, and then after that, I would like, if you don't mind, I'd like to go ahead and, and, and talk about some of these EVPs. Perfect. And uh, we've got those samples that you sent over, um, so you can explain it, You know, let us know what's going on with them. Uh, and actually, I, I would like to, uh, for you to kind of explain what an EVP is and cool. how it makes sense in the investigations. Uh, you're listening to Muses, Memoirs, and More. I'm your host, Adam Messer, and today's guest is Ryan Dunn. Uh, we are live on WRUULP Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRUU.org. We are Savannah Soundings Community Radio with Global Soul. So thank you very much. If you're just now tuning in, uh, we're, we're talking today with Ryan Dunn. He has his tourism company. He writes. He's on television. Uh, we've been talking a little bit about the writing, but we've been talking more so about uh, his process with investigations uh, for paranormal things here in Savannah. Um, and we're getting ready to talk about a kind of a, a scary subject. I, I kind of think it's kind of freaky, kind of scary. Uh, EVPs. So, Ryan, can you can you explain for the audience um, 
you know, what is an EVP and, and why is it, why is it so important? So um, one of the most interesting pieces of evidence we capture as an investigator are these audio recordings, mm-hmm. also called EVPs. And that just means electronic voice phenomena. Okay. And it's just an audio recording of a spirit. But we capture these by going into these buildings with these digital audio recorders. And we begin by asking questions pertaining to history or okay. maybe deaths that occurred there. And most of the time, we don't hear anything until we stop the recording and play it back. But a lot of times, we play it back and we can hear voices answering with direct responses. Oh, and wow. we believe they're just speaking on a frequency we can't hear. And these recorders are imprinting those frequencies and playing it back into a form we can understand. You know, and that, that kind of makes sense because animals can see things that we can't see. They can hear different frequencies that we can't hear you know, as humans. Uh, so it does make sense that there would be some kind of other frequency out there that they, you know, they could hear. This first one, um, Alligator Soul. Yeah, that's a restaurant over on Bernard Street. It's actually on the north end of our where our, our tour starts at uh, Telfair Square. But the owner, Maureen Craig, she's owned it um, for the past 15, 20 years. Her and her husband, Hilbo Craig, they came over from Washington State and moved here. Well, um, Hilbo is a retired World War II veteran, or excuse me, Vietnam veteran. And he died in 07 of lung cancer. Hmm. And she's had hauntings there for many years of her husband that she says he hangs around the restaurant. The chefs have seen him in a chef coat in the kitchen. So we investigated there a few years ago. And a few weeks after the case, my equipment technician gave me a call. He said, Ryan, I've got this EVP, but I can't figure out the name. I can't find it in the history. And I said, well, Chris, what does it say? And he said, I asked whose, na- whose name was or who's in here. What is your name? And a male voice answered, Hillary. And I got chills, and I said, Chris, that's Hilbo's name. His real name was Hillary Craig. Oh, wow. He went by the nickname of Hilbo because he didn't like being called Hillary too much. <laughs> Hilbo. So uh, everybody Hilbo. called him Hilbo, and Chris is like, well, I think we have him on recording. Wow. And I was able to play that back for Maureen, and she believes that's her husband coming through from the other side saying his name Hillary. Oh, wow. Um, well, let's, let's listen to it real quick. It's a, it's a very brief one. I'm going to try to play it um, maybe a couple times and see what we got. Oh, that was oh, the, that was the next one. I'm sorry. Right, let me go back to the. Excuse me. Yellers. Oh, yeah. I'm gonna play it one more time just because, uh, just to hear it. Yellers. Okay, so that was uh, Hilbo's EVP. Right. And what did you think after you heard it? You know, it's, uh, even before I heard it, as soon as Chris was asking Ryan who is Hillary, I had chills because I had a feeling that, okay, there's something going on, getting a male voice Hillary. And then yeah. to hear it was amazing. And there was me, Chris, and his wife Mandy on the team that night on the investigation. And none of us sound anything like that. So, mm. And we're in the basement of a restaurant at 3 o'clock in the morning. So it was amazing to get that right there on location. I, when I when I listened to it yesterday, I, I I wasn't really sure what I was hearing, um, because you know I've never really listened to EVPs before. Uh, you sent them over, you know, kind of a preview for the show, and uh, I was I was like freaked out. I was like, this is this is some weird stuff. You right. know, it's like definitely, you know, some different stuff out there. Um, what did what did his wife say? She was really uh, very upset, but in a good way. You know, she mm-hmm. wasn't distraught. I feel like it gave her a little peace of mind to mm-hmm. verify. She knew he was there. But she didn't to think have, she was crazy. Right. And yeah. to have verification that, yeah, he's still hanging around. You know, I think he just wants to be near her because she still misses him. Right. Right. So. Um, yeah, I'm just, I'm still kind of just <laughs> processing it all myself. Uh, did it give her some closure? I think it did. You know, and Maureen still, I see her when I'm starting my tour sometimes, and then she'll walk by with her dog, Sebastian, mm-hmm. uh, her little cocker spaniel. She'll come by and say, hey. And she'll tell the whole tour, yeah, he got my cu- husband to come through on an EVP. And she's like, he found my husband here. Is Hilbo still haunting? Yes. Uh, they still have chefs. Claim he's still in the kitchen. So. Wow. Wow. Okay. All right. Um, so the next one is uh, Bradley's Lock and Key. Yeah, this is an interesting story. Um, Mr. Bradley and his family have owned that lock shop over on State Street for over 100 years. But a really tragic event happened in 1994. Um, Mr. Bradley's brother was murdered by a serial killer named Gary Ray Bowles. Here in Savannah? mm, Here in Savannah. Uh, Mr. Bradley's brother had had a lobotomy after being a World War II soldier, so he's very feeble-minded and weak. His name was Milton Bradley. No relation to the game guy. Right. But uh, Milton was strangled to death, and his body is found on the golf course here in Savannah. Oh, wow. Well, we were investigating Bradley's Lock and Key, 
And in the back of the building, we caught this raspy, very soft EVP of an old man saying, help me. Mm. Caught in the exact same area we believe Milton was strangled in. Mm. And we think it's the residual haunting of Milton, you know, saying, help me. You can still hear the, the raspy breath like he's being strangled. All right, let's listen. Let's listen to that. This is creepy. Get out! Oh, that's the next oh, that, one. Yeah, I'm sorry. Just Very good. Technology. Okay. So, yeah, it was very weak and faint, but it right. was, you know, like a help me. Um, again, you know, what happened with the, when you when you found that and you reported it to them? This job is usually really fun. That was not one of the few times I wanted to go back and really show him that, hey, I think I've still got a recording of your brother saying help me in the same area he was, you know, he was murdered. Um, but, uh, you know, I don't think that in that case I was able to really offer him some closure, mm -hmm. but, um, it's interesting to, you know, to document that Milton might still be there. You know, mm -hmm. people have seen him walking around the shop late at night and everything after closing in the old lock shop. Wow. All right. Uh, so we have, we have this next one is a uh, Hamilton Turner Inn. um, now that's a really interesting haunted bed and breakfast over on Lafayette square. So just not far from where we're at now. Yeah. Um, and Mr. Hamilton, his daughter died of an uh, iron deficiency in 1898 in room 201. And he died 11 months later of heart failure. Mm. And a lot of people think it was him losing his daughter. She was 23 when she died, and he was so upset and distraught. Yeah, that makes sense. Died. Yeah. Um, but the room his daughter died in, they've seen him walking around in the room right near the bed. And it took her about two weeks to pass away from this deficiency. So he was in the room. So she basically suffered from anemia? It was uh, almost like an anemia. They called it chlorosis on the death certificate, which okay. meant the green sickness. If you look up chlorosis now, there is no such disease. Okay. This was in 1898. Okay, so. I got you. So it's still early medical. Yeah, even teething was thought to be a cause of death back then on death certificates. Oh, wow. As we know now, it's probably fever, not right, teething. Right, right. But um, chlorosis, we knew, was an iron deficiency in the 1890s. And it caused a green hue of the skin from the loss of all this iron. So maybe some form of anemia or very serious form. Okay. And um, she, she, she died in this room. Well, Mr. Hamilton's known to haunt the room and walk around the room she died in like he's still watching over his daughter. Um, I immediately walked into that room for an investigation and... On location, usually we don't hear him to the playback. I hear this man's voice growl, get out, very clearly in my left ear. So I start laughing, thinking one of our team members just snuck up behind me, and we don't do Messing pranks. Around, yeah. And I'm a little mad, too, thinking, look, guys, we got to take it yeah, serious. This, yeah. And I look behind me, the room's completely empty. My, both my guys are still downstairs. Oh, wow. So I said, okay, this is weird. And I played the recording back and called to get out. And I think it's Mr. Hamilton. It sounds like an angry old man. Yeah, and yeah. I think he was kind of ticked him in his daughter's room at 2 o'clock in, in the morning. his daughter's room, so. yeah. Yeah, I would be upset. <laughs> yeah, I don't think he took it, took All it right. too nicely. Let's, let's listen to this one. Um, try to play it a couple times. All right, so that definitely sounds like get out. Right. Yeah. Uh, what did they say when you when he told them this? The, most of their I mean, hauntings, this is like this is uh, 120 years ago. Right. And this is um interesting. Uh, most of their hauntings are usually pretty friendly. Uh, mm -hmm. So I don't think there's anything like you know trying to harm me, but I don't think they like the fact you know I'm presenting them something saying get out at a really nice high end B and B either. So the, yeah, not favorable type yeah. of friendly ghost type thing but they do a lot of business with us and they, they're really good and they've had um nothing with guests running out of the inn or anything in right the night nothing too crazy so, so not a malevolent spirit just more like a dad kind of saying get away from my daughter type i think so and um you know i think i think every guest has different experiences there but they've also heard like partying going on late at night in the parlor when no one else is in there so the hamilton family is really rich and they did throw parties so i think there's some residual from that too yeah that uh i tell you what that's a very uh interesting stuff i mean like i said yesterday when i was listening to it i was like you know i'm glad they you know gave the backstory and the you know kind of the history of it because i was just listening to it. i was like this is you know it doesn't it doesn't sound produced to right. me it, it it doesn't sound you know like like something was you know created or faked right you know what i mean and i mean i know i know that you wouldn't do that anyway because right, you, you know you're you're a very reputable person um but when you think about this kind of stuff, there's so much out there that is kind of hokey. Oh, gosh, yes, yes. And, you know, you hear something that sounds legit, and you're like, you know, kind of gives you shivers. Right. You know, um, that that's something going back to, like, we were talking earlier, how do you kind of separate, you know, the wheat from the chaff? You know, what? how do you figure out, like, does this sound 
like it, let's just say somebody had a, a a tape recorder an old school thing here right. in a room that was playing like you know some kind of noise or something like that like have you ever had someone try to bait and set it up like that we haven't thank god yet not yet but i do always look at those type of things because i'm a believer but i treat it from a skeptic standpoint right so every time i go into a building i'm looking for hidden recorders microphones you just never know yeah and and so kind of far we've up. had very valid people but i wouldn't put it past someone at some point to try yeah. to gain business by setting something up also we document down to the minute exactly which room everyone was in so that way you know who was there when we were talking so you, you know a timeline not, right and we're not like whispering in the right. background we're not allowed to whisper on investigations and that type of thing to right. eliminate a lot of the the background noise any kind of overlay or whatever and also mm -hmm. even if you have a secluded place you're going to hear outside noise people yelling outside right um if it's an old hospital it could be a plane flying over so when we hear noises on location, we'll document it on the recorder and timestamp it. So, like, for example, with the plane, you would say, like, a minute five, plane. Plane flew over, right. Right. Or so if there's a scream, part... you know, because we've heard, we caught screams in some of these asylums at night we didn't hear on location. Oh, wow. But, you know, if you're doing an investigation, even on a slow Sunday night near the riverfront, there's going to be some drunk person yelling. So yeah. we like to document those noises so we can eliminate any possibilities of yeah, especially here in Savannah. I mean, yeah. it's a big, <laughs> especially around St. Patrick's Day. Uh, you know, it's a huge uh, party town. Uh, you know, a lot of people come into town, and, and so you never know. I think, uh, I think with that kind of line of investigation, you know, it, it, there is so much unexplained stuff. So yeah, it's, it's really interesting to see how you try. You know, you keep you try to document it. Uh, you try to make sure that you know there's as much uh, concrete evidence supporting what you're doing or not you know there right. might be times where you've done an investigation and you're like no this is you know this is definitely not um you know something paranormal um so i think that's that's really interesting um now i know we were talking earlier you have a big announcement and i don't want to tease anybody yeah um but let's let, can we i don't want you to do the announcement just yet but can okay. we give somebody like a little teaser um you know, is is there anything that you can kind of reveal without giving the the thing away? Oh, that's hard. I'm trying to think of a way to to tease it without without throwing it all out there. Um, has it has something to do with another historical town, town right? another historic town, right? And it has a lot of history as well, and a lot of hauntings, a lot of hauntings. Um, you you do have your uh, upcoming show, right? Right. Yeah, we're gonna be airing. Um, actually, the new season's airing right now on uh, Southern Charm Savannah. I'm not sure which episode we're going to be on. Uh, they haven't told us, but right. within the next few episodes, we're, we took them on an investigation at Moon River. Okay. And then uh, mid-October, we're going to be on Most Terrifying Places in America on Sci-Fi Channel. Wow. Uh, excuse me, Travel Channel. Travel, Travel Channel. Channel. That's awesome. All right. Uh, everybody listening in, uh, this is Muses and Memoirs and More, uh, where we interview artists, entertainers, and authors. Uh, Ryan Dunn is our special guest today. He actually uh, does a lot of things. He writes... He, uh, he has his own tour company here in Savannah that focuses on uh, haunted areas and, and places. He does uh, paranormal investigations, and uh, he's also been on quite a few uh, television shows with investigations. So stay tuned. We're going to do our um, half an hour break, and uh, we'll be back in a couple minutes. And then after the break, we're going to talk some more about uh, the investigatory process that you do. We're going to talk about uh, the television shows and you know what it's like doing that. Um, and and uh, then we've got a Ryan's got a big reveal that he's actually um, it's going to be here heard here first, right? Yep, heard here first. Haven't so, said anything. So, all right. Uh, thanks everybody for listening in, and uh, stay tuned. We'll be right back. W R U U L P Savannah, Georgia, one hundred seven point five FM. W R U U dot O R G. We are Savannah Soundings Community Radio with Global Soul. WRUU brings you the most diverse and passionate local radio programming on the air in Savannah. This all-volunteer and non-profit community radio station accepts no money from any form of government. Our diversity and independence is made possible only through the generous financial support of listeners like you. We rely on your annual and ongoing monthly contributions to cover the many costs associated with bringing you our broadcast and web programming. If you are a contributor, thank you. If you are not yet a contributor, please show your appreciation of the role WRUU plays in your life 
by becoming a contributor in any amount. You can donate quickly and easily by credit card or check. Just find the Donate and Subscribe links at WRUU.org. Thanks for listening to and supporting WRUU. Suicide is the second leading cause of death among young adults. Friends of those struggling with mental health issues can be incredibly influential in helping them get the help they need. Three out of four young adults will turn to a peer in a time of crisis for support. Equip yourself with the resources you need to help your friends, such as tutorial videos, warning signs, conversation starters, and more at seizetheawkward.org. And if you or someone you know is having thoughts of suicide, call the Georgia Crisis and Access Line at 1-800-715-4225. Tune in Saturdays at 3 p.m. to Muses, Memoirs, and More, your show about authors, artists, and entertainers with your host, Adam Messer. You're listening to WRUULP Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRUU.org. We are Savannah Soundings Community Radio with Global Soul. And welcome back, everybody. You're listening to Muses, Memoirs, and More. I'm your host, Adam Messer. And if you're just now tuning in, we have a special guest today, uh, Ryan Dunn. You're listening to us here on WRUULP Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRUU.org. We are Savannah Soundings Community Radio with Global Soul. And Ryan, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, we've talked a lot about... Uh, the investigation process you do a lot of paranormal investigations you have a tour company you write you've been on um, a lot of different television uh, series about investigations and stuff like that and this last uh, last 10 minutes or so we were listening to some of those EVPs um, of some of the investigations you've done here in Savannah so uh, it's just uh, kind of blowing my mind today <laughs> with all this stuff it's, it's it's really cool it's kind of creepy kind of spooky um, what what do you love the most about it? That's a tough question. You know, I love the history. I love going to the historic society and digging through the files and separating fact and fiction. But I think I really get the most adrenaline from doing the investigations. There's mm -hmm. nothing like being in an old morgue at 2 o'clock in the morning or an old surgery room in the middle of an old hospital. Where you would never catch me. <laughs> <laughs> no recording and nothing around you and having stuff happen. It's amazing. Yeah. I, uh, I, wanted, to, I wanted to talk to you about the... Uh, the television s stuff that you do because you, you've written and you obviously you have to you know work on your your tour uh, production where you know you take people around and, and you, you talk to them about the historical values and things like that here in Savannah. What um, what was it like being on some of the different shows that you've been on and and how did you get involved in doing television in the first place? Um, the first television show we did was A and E's My Ghost Story caught on camera. I think that was in two thousand eleven. And we were just lucky. I got an email from the producer. They are scouting out different locations across mm -hmm. the U.S. for good ghost stories. And he said, we need your best video and audio evidence. And at that time, the best stuff we had was from Savannah Theater. I sent it in, not thinking anything of it. And a week later, I had a call from the producer. And he goes, we're going to fly you out to L.A. to film. And mm. I'm thinking, oh, this is perfect. So after that, it kind of got the ball rolling and more producers were looking at us. Um, so we do get a lot of calls, and uh, with Nick, we did Paranormal Lockdown two years ago with Nick, who used to be on Ghost Adventures, and that was because we had filmed a show with the news, local news, at Chatham County Jail, and somehow he saw it on YouTube or God knows what, Yeah. and he liked the jail and wanted to investigate, so they contacted us, so that was kind of cool. Wow, wow. I, I think it's interesting because, you know, Savannah has a huge uh, acting community. Uh, there are a lot of local actors. You know, the state of Georgia, Atlanta, all the way to Savannah, have you know really kind of taken off the last couple of years with film production and television production. There's a lot of different things. Savannah's still kind of a sleeper town. You know, I think uh, um, a lot of celebrities can come to town and not get overwhelmed and rushed by you know mobs of people trying to get their picture and things like that. And you know, it seems like local celebrities that come into town that you know they. Uh, they enjoy the scenery they enjoy the historical value you know they enjoy you know the way that they're treated in the food and that kind of thing here and it's it's interesting to me you know here you are in savannah and you know you've been on a lot of different tv shows you know you've got your upcoming show 
in October. Um, can you tell the guests about? Yeah, the the October one is uh, most terrifying places in America on Travel Channel. They do a series every year or two about places across the U.S. And we did the Marshall House investigation with them, beginning yeah. around mid October. So, in, in a way, you you become like a local celebrity uh, with the different things that you've done. And um, what, what's it like, uh, you know, just kind of going from being a regular guy to you know getting on TV and then having you know different fan base, you know, or people that you know kind of contact you out of nowhere saying, "Hey, I saw your show. I think it was really cool." You know, what's what's that like? Um, it's fun, but it's interesting too. Sometimes, you know, me and my wife, it's hard for us to go out because we'll go to the grocery store or something, and nobody mobs us or anything like that, but. People will come up to us and start talking about their house being haunted and wanting us to investigate. So yeah. it's nice, but I feel like I'm working 24-7. There's know, no there's, off time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm always talking about ghosts, which I enjoy, <laughs> thank God. You have to wear a shirt like I'm off duty. Uh, right, right. So it's usually not like, you know, people, nothing like autographs or anything like, you know, like real celebrities. But it's more so just people wanting to talk to me about hauntings and more more information. And they're yeah, really you're, you're getting to be well known around Savannah. So it's, it's pretty cool. That's one of the things with the show that I like to talk to people about their process and you know we've had uh different authors i mean authors on um the first uh several episodes so it's, it's really interesting you know to talk to with you because you had more tv experience you've written books you know you obviously uh it's focused on the paranormal investigations and stuff like that um with that you know you have to juggle a lot right i mean you juggle a lot you have your company you know you're working on another book you know, you work on a new television series. How do you manage? <laughs> I mean, you know, you have a, a wife and kids, right? Yeah, wife you have and a family daughters, and, yeah. <laughs> and an English bulldog. He's our son. So, um, yeah, it's really fun. But a lot of times, you know, it is hard to juggle with the family. And I'm gone a lot. You know, last week we were going to do some family stuff, and I was in St. Augustine doing some research and traveling here and there. Um, but you know, I do take family time very seriously. So when we have family time, we just kind of shut the phones off. And yeah, you have to kind of like, seclude yourselves. Yeah. So uh, one of our biggest or famous trips every year is we go to the mountains, the cabins up nice. in North Georgia for nice. at least a week at a time. Just yeah. to get away. There's no, we don't even get a signal out there. So no cell great. phone. Yeah. Just kind of have to make sure everything's packed. <laughs> yeah. So that's uh, that's my biggest thing. And you know, by, by expanding and branching out and building such a big company, we do expect to have even more time, you know, with the family. But I do get called out a lot for filming and this and that, so it's it's definitely busy. And you know, that's an interesting point that you make. You get called out a lot, and something I think people don't understand is that call can come at any time, and they can ask you to be available at any time. Right. right? And I've, um, when I filmed with uh, Paranormal Lockdown, the show I was talking about with Nick, my daughter had brain surgery the next day at 10 a.m. Wow. And they called the day two days before her surgery and said we want to film. So I did the night before. Filmed for a few hours, went home, you know, said my prayers for a surgery and went to the surgery the next morning. Everything went great. But, I mean, people probably don't even know that during that filming, I, was, I also had Bell's palsy. So the whole right side of my face was oh, numb. Wow. So I'm trying to film and talking with a funny, you know, ha, you know half paralyzed face and daughter having brain surgery. So it was, you know, a lot going on. Oh, but at very the same stressful. Time, yeah. I did drop everything because it was a great opportunity that I didn't want to let pass by. I think... Uh, Th that shows a lot about your work ethic. You know, obviously you're very family oriented, um, but it shows a lot about your work ethic and being able to, you know, prioritize, hey, this is an opportunity. If I say no, it might not come around again. Right. And how do, how do you judge that sense of, is this the right opportunity or not? Because we were talking earlier about, you know, filtering out calls and, you know, hauntings and, and different investigations that you want to do or not do. Right. How do you decide, okay, is this an opportunity that I want to do, you know, especially with, you know, in the film industry or, or television, you know? Um, one of the biggest things is just making sure there's enough validation for hauntings. You know, if someone's saying they just hear a few footsteps, we're not mm -hmm. going to spend all the time doing the research and right. doing the investigation. <laughs> But if you've got a restaurant, for instance, and there's a lot of employees that are quitting and different people over time have had a lot of validation, it gives us more, more, you know, evidence or more, more to build a case on. Right. Um, that way there's a lot more happening besides just a few noises here and there. You know, if there's stuff that could be a ghost, but we're not going to come out for every little bump in the night. Yeah. And, and, and just to clarify for everybody listening, uh, Ryan is not an actor. He is, uh, he's not an actor at all. You, you don't act no. at all. It's, it's purely, uh, reality-based television series that you're working on right you know, and you were talking you know earlier about you know some of that and and you won't you won't fake it 
And no. that, that's something that I think is really cool about you because, you know, you, you're not going to fake it just because of television. We've had uh, producers before try to get us to fake stuff or to say something happened, for instance. They'll take us to the side and say, hey, say you were attacked by a shadow figure, for instance. And we'll put our foot down and say no. And uh. they've threatened to pull our show before. And we'll say, well, you know, thanks for filming with us. Have a nice day. And sure enough, they'll still air the show. you got to call their bluff. But... I'd rather lose the show and then lose my credibility. Yeah, so. I mean, one it, today's world, especially with the internet and things like that, one one bad rep it just kind of can knock your whole exactly your whole gig out. So I think that's really cool that you know, and, that, and that's something that I, I try to encourage people. Because sometimes people ask me, "Well, when can I call myself a writer?" I'm like, "Well, you have to do the work, you know." And in your line of work, this is what you're doing. You know, you you're out here interacting with people that are coming from all over the world to Savannah. Um, you're doing these television shows, you know, you write, you write your, your books and, you know, obviously like today you're on this show talking with us, you know, which is really cool, but being you wherever you go, you know, and that's why I try to encourage people is like, right. you know, just be you <laughs> don't, don't do something different, you know, and you know, don't, don't try to have a different face for every, every scenario because you can't, you can't cover it. Yeah, you got to start small. You know, when I was investigating, when I started in 2010 with my wife, we were carrying our equipment in a little a backpack. Yeah. And now we've got probably five or six Pelican cases full of stuff. Wow. But it just takes time. you got to build it up, you know. And if you stay with it, it's going to build up, and you'll be able to get the ball rolling and make something big of it. Yeah, I think that's uh, – I think that work, you know, the, the, the ethic of, of just doing the work is a big thing for anybody who is a creative person or creator. Uh, you have to You have to get in there. You have to do the work. You have to – you know, not give up when it's kind of hard and boring, you know, when you're trying to work through the muck and the, the mire, you know, you have to I think people see that away. too, you know, people think it's on the tour all the time for putting the extra work, doing the history research and putting the work because anybody can tell stories, but if you put in the legwork, it makes a huge difference. So. Yeah, yeah, you, you do the historical research for the different areas that you present. You uh, you talk about you know the characters or the people that are involved with it, you know I think that's something that's really cool that you actually spend that time to not only you're not crafting a story you're retelling a story you're, right. you're you're kind of giving it a historical perspective exactly and you know we we of course our tours lend towards more of the dark gory history but of course we do make sure it's fact based and it's stuff people really want to hear about you know so you know we were talking earlier about like what genre I, I was just thinking historical paranormal nonfiction i think it's perfect i think it's yeah because completely... your stuff is based off historical right and it's paranormal and it's nonfiction because you're not trying to you know you're not trying to make anything up no and even so. the, the accounts you know of people that have had experiences we list their real names in the book you know here's the such and such employee that had mm -hmm. this happen and that way you can go into that place and ask that person about it if you've read the book so what, what do you encourage uh for uh people that uh, either want to get into writing or into investigations or even uh, folks that are trying to you know just get the work out there what do you how do you encourage them do you get that question a lot too because... i do um, i just don't give up you know we've had people you know beside before i started this i was in a band for many years and we built up a really great following but you're always gonna have people tell you that you're not good enough or this isn't gonna work and just push right. past it man it's yeah there's a lot of haters out uh, there and if you if you listen to everyone and stop you know half these people that have become famous musicians and other investigators and things like that they never would have made it if they would have given up so yeah i think i think we can be our own worst critics right uh, even though there's a lot of uh vitriol out there there's a lot of people out there that you know they they don't like you for whatever reason or they're jealous or whatever I, and i think you're right you have to kind of just you know i i don't honestly i don't even give any kind of uh basis to a, a criticism that has nothing to offer as far as how I could have done something better. If right. it's just a purely hateful statement, out the door. Yeah. If it's worry. something that's like someone's being kind of rude, but it's something like, well, you could have done this better, or you could have done that better, right. and they're being kind of rude, and I think, well, wait a minute, maybe there's something I could take out of this, you know, and I can improve what I'm doing. You know, so that's something I try to work on, you know, when, I have, when I've got something like that. And then, you know, the business I'm in, I'm going to have naysayers. You know, you're going right. to have people that don't believe, and that's, that's fine. Everybody has their own opinion, but... If I would listen to all that, I wouldn't be here now, you know. So I like to push forward through that type of stuff too. Yeah. What um, you know, I I don't want to tease everybody again. Um, <laughs> do you do you want to go ahead and do the announcement? Yeah, we now? can do it if you want to. Okay. So everybody uh, listening in, this is this is kind of really a uh, unique opportunity that we have here. Uh, Ryan Dunn, he has his tourism company here in Savannah. He's well known around Savannah. He's also been on a you know a lot of different TV shows. He's expanding the empire, 
and I, I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over to you, but I think it's really cool. Everybody, you, this is, you're going to be kind of um, blown away, I think, with this announcement. So I appreciate you, you being here. Yeah, so thanks to everyone that's you know listening. And also, we've had Afterlife tours here in Savannah since 2013, so we're a little over five years in. And uh, coming October this year, we're going to be opening in St. Augustine. So we will have another Afterlife tours in St. Augustine running. Uh, I'm excited. It's happening really quick. So we've got three more places to investigate down there to add on our tour. We'll have it done in the next couple of weeks, and it'll be open probably 1st of October. Uh, and that coincides with the same time that you're doing your new show. Exactly. So a lot happening in October for Afterlife Tours. Yeah, you've got, you've got a lot of work ahead of you in the yeah. next three months. <laughs> so, yeah, I've got already got a ton of audio to go through, video. Um, I've been at the Historic Society the past few weeks, and I've been in St. Augustine the past month investigating. So I know there are a lot of folks. Uh, my mom and dad used to travel to St. Augustine for a vacation every summer. And um, you know they used to talk about you know, it's a beautiful old Spanish uh, town. Um, and I think that there's a lot, you know, uh, I wouldn't say it's necessarily a sister city of Savannah, but I, I could imagine as far as the paranormal areas, there's probably a ton of unexplored stuff down there. There's a lot. There's, um, I can't, I went down there a few weeks ago and it's just amazing. And I was just came back two days ago and it's, it's amazing what we're finding, um, investigating some of the old forts, the old cemeteries and the evidence we're capturing so far is, is really, really good. That's awesome. Well, thank you uh, for making that announcement here. I'm really excited for you, you know, and I think it'll be a neat uh, way to expand what you're doing here. And especially, uh, you know, back and forth. I, I, I could imagine, you know, the, the folks that come to Savannah would be interested in going to St. Augustine and, and vice versa, you know, because you, you've got two historical uh, classical cities, you know, and there's so much history. There's so there's so much drama. I mean, there there's just so much out there. Um, yeah, you've got years of work ahead of you. Oh, it's it's going to be amazing. And then, you know, after that, we're going to be headed to a third and fourth city. So it's just going to keep building, hopefully. So Yeah. Uh, everybody, thank you for listening. You're, uh, you're listening to Muses, Memoirs, and More. I'm your host, Adam Messer, and our special guest today is Ryan Dunn. You're listening to us on WRUULP Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRUU.org. We are Savannah Soundings Community Radio with Global Soul. So we have about we have about uh, ten minutes left, Ryan. Um, do you mind if we play the EVPs one more time? Yeah, no, and just kind of go cool. through. Uh, I'm going to play all three of them. Okay. At, at one time, and then could you just go through what the I know you were talking about it earlier, but could you just go through for like the people that are just catching up to the second half of the, the, the radio show, what, um, what happened and, and what those EVPs mean in those investigations? Yeah, of course. Okay, cool. All right, let me get this. All right. So this first one is alligator soul, uh, Hillary. Actually, that's to get out, I think. Yeah, oh, I'm okay. I'm sorry. No, you're good. Hillary. Hillary. Okay. So that first one was Alligator Soul Hillary. And you can hear in the background there's some thunder and lightning. Uh, which had, he's brought them. <laughs> yeah. Um, the next one is Bradley's Lock and Key. Help me. Get out. And that was uh, Get Out with uh, Hamilton Turner in. So... Without go going to the backstory, because we've got that in the earlier segment, they can listen to that on the podcast um, when uh, when we have it up on YouTube. Those EVPs are recordings that you captured during some investigations, correct? Correct, yeah. And you use uh, digital recording equipment, mm -hmm. right? Um, you have a strict policy of no whispering. You also uh, make sure that you do uh, an overview of where you're going to make sure there's not something kind of like a setup, you know, somebody's got something there to, you know, try to it, it trap or, or, or fake, you know, some kind of, uh, um, I guess, unexplained phenomenon. Right. With that, your whole process that you have going on, you, you set these different steps up, you, you do the investigation, you do some historical research, you know, before you go in or whatever. How do you pull all of that together and then decide what, it is. How do you, how do you, like, you know, obviously with like the Hillary one, that's, right. that's kind of a connection with the, you know, the owner of the restaurant, right. that kind of thing. How do you decide how, what, what is that like, you know, kind of filtering through all that. And then, then you come to, you know, your, your, your findings. Yeah. We try to tie a lot of the EVPs with people that have died in the building or tragedies or pe places, people that are hauling the locations. 
So a lot of times, Mr. Hamilton being one of the only male deaths and Hamilton Turner in, we feel like it's him maybe saying the get out. But then sometimes we do capture these EVPs and we have no idea who or what it is that's answering these questions. Right. So as much as we can find, sometimes we are left with some unanswered questions at times. But um, it's amazing to be able to get some of these voices of these spirits that are sometimes over 100 years old in death that we're capturing, talking back to us. I think, you know, with our modern technology we have, uh, you know, we were talking about LPs. The sound of the LPs are, are so much clearer than digital sometimes. Right. You have the you know, have high def digital and that kind of thing nowadays. It, it, we were talking about frequencies and, and not being like a human ear can only hear so many frequencies and some of the stuff, the digital can capture some of the frequencies that we can't hear. And some of the video recordings can capture some things like the infrared stuff. Right. We can't see infrared imaging, you know, right. we can't see heat vision. Right. Um, but as, as you're progressing through an investigation and you said earlier that sometimes you won't even hear it or, or see it until you actually are reviewing it. Right. You know, and like you said earlier, sometimes you might be sitting in a hallway for eight hours straight. Right. How do you process through that and be able to, I mean, like the, the different EVPs are like maybe a second. Oh, it's a lot to go through. Um, you know, a lot of producers, we've been working on trying to get a national show with this new producer, uh, Lynn Stevenson. And when I was talking to her, she said, what's the one thing that you would really like with your national show? And I said, honestly, to have people hired that would go through our stuff for us, you know? Yeah. After yeah. an investigation, just dump all the audio and video files and say, hey, tell us what you find. Right. Because it's just, it's fun, but it's very tedious going through every little sound bite, every little clip of video, and clipping it, analyzing it, cleaning it up. It's a lot of work just to get these little clips of evidence. That, I think, uh, the editing part, especially for me with writing, right. I, editing is so hard. It's I the mean, worst. It's. <laughs> Any any kind of editing, video recording, you know, sound writing, any kind of editing to me is is the most difficult part. Yeah, you know, because once you've once you've written it, I mean, you can just kind of speed through writing. Sometimes right. you can just power through, you know. Um, but then you have to go back and you have to say, well, <laughs> is this any good? Right, that's the worst. <laughs> is there anything to this? So you know, I can imagine sitting there through eight hours of you know some kind of audio could be very tedious, very you know, uh, boring at times, but then when you hear that, get out. Oh, it's amazing. And it usually happens at the worst times. It'll be three or four in the morning. The whole family's asleep. I'm going through audio cause it's quiet and I'm about to fall asleep. And all of a sudden there's the get out popping in my audio ear and just, did it freak you, you out? Know, it freaks me out all the time. So. Yeah. When I was listening to it, it actually came me chill bumps. Yeah. It's, it happens. And it's, it always happens after you've been listening for hours and there's nothing. And then all of a sudden just out of nowhere, you get these voices and it's amazing. Yeah. I, I wasn't really expecting that with the, the previews The you know, cause I was like, okay, this is cool. Maybe it's, you know, like a little clip or something like that. And then yeah, I just hear this stuff and I was like, Oh, it's kind of freaky. <laughs> I was like, oh, definitely, definitely have to have an explanation of what right. in the world is going on with this. Um, we've got about two minutes left of the show, uh, Ryan, and uh, you know we've gone over so much stuff today. But could you please uh, let everybody know your special announcement one more time before we go, and then also where can they find out more information about you, your tour company? and um, your television appearances and stuff. Yeah, so uh, the new announcement is we're opening Afterlife Tours in St. Augustine uh, in a couple of months, October 1st this year, hopefully. Uh, I've been doing investigations there. Also, uh, you can get information on our tour and tickets at afterlifetours.net. And uh, we also have a date October 14th for an investigation at Moon River. we still got some tickets left for that. We have it for six hours. So if anybody wants to come down and join us on an overnight, you can call us at our office at 912 Three nine eight seven eight two zero to get tickets for the overnight too, so they can actually get locked in with us with the equipment. That, that's kind of cool because um, the, are you selective of the people that you let go on investigations? We do. I mean, as long as you know they're of age, they have to be eighteen and older. Right. Moon Rivers rules. We can't drink that night, even though it's a brewery because the right. equipment. And as long as they're not just rowdy and they're very respectful, then they're more than welcome to join us. Yeah, I mean, I can imagine if you're, you know, using uh, the equipment, you have to make sure that, you know, the people that are there are observing and not trying to interfere with your investigation. Yeah, no bachelorette parties or bachelor parties or anything like that. <laughs> yeah, the investigations. Yeah. They can come on the tours. So. That's cool. That's cool. Well, I, I really appreciate you being on today, uh, Ryan. I, you know, I think it's it's there's a lot of uh, unexplained stuff here in Savannah. 
Uh, I'm sure in, in St. Augustine there's going to be a ton of unexplained stuff. You know, I, I really appreciate your historical approach to the research and that you just try to present, you know, your findings uh, because there is there's a lot of stuff out there that's, you know, not so credible, a lot of Photoshop stuff out there, oh, a lot, gosh, you know. Yeah. So it, it's really nice to see someone who's actually out there trying to, you know, not, not just – push a business not just trying to t you know do ticket sales you're actually trying to get to the bottom of these different and, and offer closure for people you know especially loved ones of a recently deceased uh, family member or something like that so thank you very much for being on the show today and uh, ryan did you have anything else you want to say before you go gosh thanks for having me adam it was awesome cool cool all right well i appreciate you and